Her er så anden og sidste del af interviewet med Patrick Moore, hvor han svarer på spørgsmål for jer, brugere af klimarealisme. Denne gang taler vi både om klorin, valer og kvaliteten af de videnskabelige udgivelser, der kommer i dag. Velkommen indenfor. Dr. Patrick Moore, once again, thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Thank you, Ricky. It's good to be back. Mm. This is the second interview about, uh, for, with the questions from the viewers, and uh, let's get on with it. Uh, the first question is, uh, what was this, the point where you felt you have to leave uh, Greenpeace? What, what was the, the turning point? That's a very important question in terms of my history and uh, philosophy. When we began in Greenpeace, you remember it was the beginning of the 1970s. The consciousness of the environment was only just emerging. The word ecology had still not been used in the popular press. But I was doing a PhD in ecology as an academic, and I wanted to do something different. So I heard about this little group meeting in the church basement in Vancouver, Canada, which is where Greenpeace began, to protest against US hydrogen bombs in Alaska, to sail a boat across the ocean, to provide a focus for media attention. And then we did that and we won and President Nixon canceled the tests. So this was a great grassroots victory on the day that that bomb went off. We didn't stop the one we were protesting against. It was the ones that would come after that were canceled. Every single border crossing between the United States and Canada was closed the day that bomb went off by Canadians and Americans coming from both sides of the border and holding hands in solidarity against nuclear war. So. In my estimation, this was actually, even though they bury it in history, was a very important day. The turning point of the global arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States. Well, of course, we went on. We went on to stop French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. That's a whole big story in itself. Then we turned our attention to the great whales. 30,000 whales were being killed each year in the oceans, mainly by the Japanese and Russians. We got out there in boats and put ourselves in front of the harpoons, got on television around the world, and this is what made Greenpeace famous, because we were saving life from death and these huge whales and people really related to it. Well, on and on we went with various other campaigns Eventually, we, be, we became Greenpeace International. This was the result of an out-of-court law settlement, which I had to file against the big breakaway from our United States group, which we had created, and then they decided they wanted all the money. So that, that settlement of that lawsuit resulted in Greenpeace International in 1979, where all the countries that had sprung up with Greenpeace offices, Paris, London, Amsterdam, Sydney, New Zealand, Canada, all across the United States, Washington, San Francisco, all then became part of one international organization under an international constitution. So 1979, and we carry on. I become one of five international directors, but unfortunately the only one with any science education. All my fellow directors were either political activists, social activists, or now seeking a career in the environmental movement as an environmentalist, because now there was enough money for the payroll. And there's where things started to change. Pretty soon, we had 100, 200, 500 people on the payroll, and fundraising suddenly went higher up to the top of our priorities. And also, we had taken on most of the important issues. By now, we were working to stop the poison from being dumped from factories into the rivers of Europe. 
North America had passed good air and water pollution legislation in the 70s. But even by the early 80s, most of the European countries did not have this legislation and their rivers were dead. The Rhine was dead. The Elbe was dead. The Thames was dead. And we saved those rivers. That was our, that was sort of my last time in Greenpeace. We did many other things during that time too, but that was the biggest thing we were doing. Well, as we moved along, for some reason, the peace in Greenpeace kind of got lost. Of course, the peace stood for people and ending the threat of nuclear war and saving civilization. The green, of course, stood for nature. And I found myself among people more and more left oriented coming in who were saying that humans are the enemies of the earth, that humans are the enemies of nature. And I'm saying, well, I'm an ecologist. I know that all life, including ourselves, evolved from the same source. We're all part of life. We're not the only evil species on the planet. There's 1.7 million species and we're the only bad one? Just a minute here. I mean, that's too much like original sin for me. I'm not a fire and brimstone kind of guy. I believe in humans. I love humans. I love my family. I love my country. And I love everybody except the few bad people who, of course, there are some, and probably every species has some bad ones in it. Who knows? But this is what happened. And then, almost as if they couldn't figure out what else to have for a new campaign, my fellow directors insisted that we have a new campaign called Ban Chlorine Worldwide. Now, chlorine, of course, was used as a weapon, as an elemental gas in World War I. So it, it as an element, is very toxic and can kill you. But table salt, sodium chloride, for just for an example, is an essential nutrient. We cannot live without it. And this is, when you come into the area of chemistry and toxicology, it's a lot more complicated than saving whales and stopping nuclear tests. Toxicology and chemistry, and particularly biochemistry, are extremely complex subjects. And if you don't have any science, you're not much use at making judgments about these things. So I said to them, I said first kind of jokingly, you know, you guys, chlorine is one of the elements in the periodic table, like one of the building blocks of the universe. It's the 11th most common element in the Earth's crust. So like maybe we should have a little bit more nuanced approach to it rather than saying ban worldwide because you can't do that anyways, even if you tried. But in, in, in terms of real issues, chlorine is both the most important element for public health, adding it to drinking water and spas and pools is the biggest advance in the history of public health to prevent waterborne communicable disease like cholera. And secondly, chlorine is the most important element for medicine which is slightly different from public health in that it's things we take in to cure disease in ourselves. Chlorine is 85% of our medicines are made with chlorine chemistry. And 25% of our medicines actually have chlorine in them. If you look at your flu or cold medicines, you'll see a little CL after some of the ingredients. So this is why I had to leave Greenpeace. I argued with them very strongly that this was a misguided campaign. They did it anyways. Today, they deny it, even though there's strong archival records of their campaign going forward at that time, them saying that women would all become breast cancer from chlorine and these sorts of things which was, you know, that's the word for that is chemophobia. And uh, they all had a bad case of chemophobia. So that is why I left Greenpeace, uh, Ricky.
because first because of the high level philosophical point of humans being the they say the humans are the enemies of the earth and secondly because of the very sharp point of saying that chlorine should be banned worldwide and uh, of course i couldn't stay in an organization that adopted those ideas they were fast becoming dependent on misinformation sensationalism and fear to get their donation to meet their payroll and i wanted to be a sensible environmentalist which is what i named myself when i left greenpeace basing my positions squarely on science and logic those are really the only two things you need as a scientist science science which is the facts and logic is how to think about them properly and so that is where i put myself in 1985 that was a little while ago and i've been going since now for the first 20 years of my after leaving greenpeace i was basically cancelled from the conversation you know why because i was too far ahead of myself too far ahead of the situation today i believe the world has finally caught up in many ways and my new book fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom is being highly regarded and accepted and is having a big influence but this is 50 years of my experience that i put in to making this book real and uh, i'm very i'm very proud of it and very pleased with it that it's doing so well to sum up a very large part of my thinking and my evolution as someone studying this beautiful earth and all its complexities, which are more or less infinite. And that is the beauty of ecology. Uh, ecology is about the interrelationships among all the different components of the global ecosystem, which is pretty close to infinite. And therefore, it can even take on a somewhat spiritual aspect because we can't really think of infinity when we try to think of infinity our brain explodes because what is it i mean is it more than everything or you know we, we don't it, it really isn't possible we can write it down with a little symbol on a piece of paper but actually comprehending what infinity is it almost leads you into mysticism uh, of the good kind uh, of being, I would say, somewhat more reverent than a lot of people are today about the beauty, the complexity, the infinity of this uh, universe we live in, especially this little rock, which behind me, look, look how many trees there are just in that one little view growing there on this earth. And so this is what gives me my spirit. And that's why, that's why I called my, my original group Green Spirit. Uh, it was a partnership that I was in for over 20 years when I was a consultant, when I was acting as a consultant to industry and government, helping them with sustainability. But then I decided to go back out on my own again, and now I'm EcoSense Environmental. Hmm. Just look at the night sky, then you have an idea of infinity. Like it's yes, exactly. difficult to <laughs> to grab your head, head around that distance. Yes. Yeah. The next question is uh, more related also to your work in Greenpeace. Uh, what is the status of the whales today? Do you know? The status of the whales is remarkably good. The humpback whales, the sperm whales, the blue whales, the fin whales, the psi whales are all recovered. The orca whales, which some people call killer whales, you know, the, the beautiful black and white ones, they are recovering too after many were taken from the wild for aquariums during the 1970s and 80s. And I was uh, fortunate to be the leader when I was in Greenpeace of the campaign to stop captive live orcas. And we stopped the very last effort 
on the west coast of North America in 1981. In 1981, we defeated the people who were trying to capture the whales. Again, in true Greenpeace style, like being out on the, out on the water, out on the ocean, and preventing them from capturing, physically preventing them from capturing the whale. And that's when they gave up and the government of Canada and British Columbia passed a law, no more whales. Now, so, uh, after that, some more were taken from Iceland, but it's over now. So, so there, there, there really is very little uh, killing of whales in the world today. The Japanese, I don't know what's wrong with their thinking. They think of whales as big fish. They, they don't make a difference between mammals and fish. And okay, uh, I'm not against fish either. But the truth is, whales, even the smallest whales, the smallest dolphins, which are no bigger than we are really, their brains are bigger than ours. Every single cetacean, cetacean as the whales are known, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, every species of them has a bigger brain than we do. This is partly because they are acoustic creatures. They use sound. Whales can see inside each other, like x-ray, like ultrasound. They have so many special properties and they've lived peacefully in the sea ever since the large dinosaurs were extincted by the asteroid that struck Yucatan in 65 million years ago. That is when the whales evolved to fill the ecological niche that the large dinosaurs, the plesiosaurs and the ichthyosaurs all went extinct during that dark, dark years when the sky was clouded with debris from the asteroid and photosynthesis ended and nearly 90% of all species went extinct, including all the dinosaurs, mm. except for the birds. Mm. People don't realize, this is just a little bit of an aside, but birds came from dinosaurs. They're not from mm. mammals. Birds are dinosaurs. Yes, some of the latest, some some of the latest dinosaurs have feathers, or evolved feathers, I believe. Yes. Well, the 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 thing is, the reason birds survived was because they could fly long distances and eat the animals that were dead, that couldn't go mm. far enough to get their own food. So this is why this is why birds survived through this period. Well, coming back, let's see, we're, we're answering this question about uh, what it was like in Greenpeace, what we did in Greenpeace. What we did in Greenpeace was we changed the consciousness of the entire world. And, and it was a good thing. But like many good things, they get hijacked. In the same way that democracy is being hijacked by Marxism in the United States today, for example and in Europe too. Uh, Greenpeace got hijacked by the political left because we had money and fame. They became, the, the, these people who are all, people who all they think about is power and politics never sleep, I don't think. You know, I, I'm an ecologist. I, I'm not trying to get control of the whole world. I'm just trying to understand it. But this urge for power in humans is a natural thing because there needs to be leadership. But it's often perverted into an egotistic form of power. And, and that is what we have to fight against all through history is dictators, people who think they should be the ones to decide everything for everybody. And uh, we're in one of those periods right now. But Back to Greenpeace, I really enjoyed my time there. I was in the top leadership. I led many, many campaigns, leading the campaign to stop the last capture of an orca in the Pacific Ocean. You can imagine how gratifying that is personally, not because of power or anything. What I tried to do was to learn to speak to the media so that we could communicate with the world at large 
because the media is the most powerful thing. You know how they say today about things going viral. We call those media mind bombs back in the day. That was really the first uh, term that expressed the concept of going viral, media mind bombs. And uh, that was what we were using language to do. But my question today is, when did it become acceptable to lie? Like really to just lie. Like right now, the president of the United States is saying the border is sealed. He's saying that in public. It's a lie. This Fauci guy said, oh, no, no, no way it came from a lab the virus. No, no way it came from the animals. It's a lie. We know that now. Absolutely know that for sure. So when did it become fashionable to lie and other people accept that it's okay to lie as if by lying, you actually change reality? Well, you do change the way people see things, that's for sure, but you're not changing reality. When you say the border is sealed and the border is not sealed, that doesn't make the border sealed. So. This dysfunction that has crept into our society today in the climate change discussion, in the COVID discussion, in the general political discussion, and the idea today that we should judge each other by the color of our skin, which we have absolutely no uh, control over how we are born with what color. And when, when clearly the color of our skin is based on which part of the earth we came from the darker people came from the tropics where the sunshine is so strong that the pigment of color keeps the ultraviolet radiation from giving you cancer it's a protection black is a protection people in norway don't need that protection because there's hardly any sun up there so they they, they lost that pigment in their skin because it was unnecessary but to think that the color of your skin is some kind of spiritual thing or some kind of, uh, I don't know, what are, they, what are they talking about? You know, they're talking about garbage is what they're talking about because it's a purely simple evolutionary factor. And just because you move from the tropics, if, 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 a, if a black person moves from Africa to Canada, they keep their skin color. I mean, it's evolutionary. They're not going to turn white just because they've moved to Canada. And so to judge people by things which they have no control over, I would judge people by their philosophy. I would judge people by whether they tell the truth or not. I would judge people about how kind they are to other people. I would judge people by many different things, and I would only ever judge them as individuals. I would never judge them as a class. That is, that is the uh, reason why I believe it is fair to say I've never been a fundamentalist, but I'm a fundamentalist today because I believe there is good and evil at work in the world. And the evil part, the evil part is judging people by their class or by their color, by their nationality, by their sex by any category whatsoever. Each person should be judged as an individual, and that is the basis of freedom. And so when it comes to ecology, I do believe there's a very strong relationship. Like you might wonder, why am I talking about these things? This is all politics. Well, no, it isn't. It's also rooted in science. It's rooted in evolution. And in my book, you may notice right on the first page, I speak about how my mother introduced me to the philosophical writings of Bertrand Russell, the great British philosopher around the time of World War I in the early part of the 20th century. And he wrote a book titled On Authority and the Individual. So the authority of the state versus the freedom of the individual. 
and it had a great influence on me because I came to realize that politics, politics, they, they, you know, politics that people use the word as if it means something more than it does. Really, the fundamental truth of politics is it is a, con a contest between those people who wish to control society versus those people who wish to be free from society's control. So individualism versus collectivism. Of course, there must be some collectivism because we are a social species and we're organized. We're organized in all kinds of different structures and organizations, the most complex of all species in terms of if you look at a corporation that's manufacturing an automobile, how many different roles there are in there. There's probably even a psychiatrist to help look after the people who are having mental difficulties on the assembly line. So you've got the whole gamut. And Bertrand Russell, so clearly, I, I, I advise anyone who wants to get a clear insight into the pure nature of what politics is. It is the tension between how much control you give the collective, the government, versus how much control you give the individual over their own life. And each society has found a different pattern. The Chinese emphasize state control. The United States, at least up until now, has emphasized individual control, freedom of speech and all of those things. This is part of ecology. It's, it's, we should not think that politics is separate from environmental discussions because we all are in this environment together practicing politics. And of course, science, which is how we find out what facts are, and that is being almost thrown out the window now. But the true way of finding facts is the scientific method. And then if we have good facts, that's what feeds into policy. You can't have good policy if you don't have good facts. If you have bad facts, you can only have bad policy. Even if you have good facts, if people ignore them, you can still have bad policy. But if you take good facts, like truth in other words, like that glacier is on that mountain behind me, that's true. That could lead to a policy of saying, we should protect that glacier, or we should stop people from going and damaging it. That would be a policy that comes out of the fact that we've decided that glacier is somehow vulnerable. It isn't really, it's been there for like uh, 20,000 years, but, uh, and it hasn't melted yet. One of the reasons the glaciers on the Vancouver Island are lasting longer than the ones in the interior is we get so much snow here. 300 inches of rain turns into a lot of snow when it's at high altitude. And so there's so much snow in the, in the winter, the summer isn't long enough to melt it all. So mm. that is why we still have these glaciers on Vancouver Island mm -hmm. that, that, that have not disappeared as much as many of the ones where there's less snow each winter. Mm. Are they growing? I, I, gro I know I ramble on endlessly, Ricky, but if you can tolerate me, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll sure. <laughs> Are, they, are the glaciers growing? Uh, no, uh, there are some places where glaciers are growing, but it's an, a minority. When the glaciers last mm. really grew was in the Little Ice Age, which was only 300 years mm. ago. If you take this interglacial period, which we call the Holocene, just going back to 20,000 years ago, was the height of the most recent glaciation. That's when almost the whole of Canada was covered in a sheet of ice and much of Northern Europe and Northern Russia. So the peak of that was about 20,000 years ago, and then it started to warm. 
For 10,000 years it warmed, until about 10,000 years ago, when all those low elevation, mid-latitude glaciers were melted and the sea had risen 120 meters from when all that water was on the land as ice, the sea had gone down by 120 meters. And when the ice melted, coming out of the glaciation period, of which there's been about 40 during this Pleistocene Ice Age, some people call it the last glacial period, as if it was the final one. That's why I always call it the most recent glacial period, because there's there's no, there's no evidence that it will be the last one. There's been 40 of them already. And so study the Pleistocene Ice Age listeners, uh, look at graphs on the internet of the different glacial periods and the different interglacial periods and go back 5 million years to when it really started getting cold on the earth. Uh, and you will learn a great deal just from that period of time. But Okay, so 10,000 years ago, the ice was melted. And indeed, as is the case coming out of most glaciation periods, the warmest period was at the beginning of this last 10,000 years. It's called the Holocene Climatic Optimum. When the Sahara Desert was green completely, there was more rainfall in the world because it was warmer only one or two degrees, but this makes a difference. And then about 6,000 years ago, it began to cool. Up until then, for that first 4,000 years of the Holocene interglacial period, there were goat herders and sheep herders all across the Sahara. There's maps showing the towns all across the Sahara. 6,000 years ago, suddenly, it broke and cooled down and stopped raining on the Sahara and all the people moved into the Nile River Valley. And this was the impetus for the beginning of the Egyptian civilization, the empire, because suddenly all these people were crowded into one place and there were people enough to build pyramids and monuments and have pharaohs and all of that. So that's what happened during this Holocene interglacial period, about halfway through it, it started to cool. And the coolest period in the entire 10,000 years of the Holocene interglacial period was what we call the Little Ice Age. So after the 6,000 year thing happened and people all moved into the Nile Valley and things like that probably happened all around the world, then came the Minoan warm period 3,000 years ago, and then a cold period. Then came the Roman warm period 2,000 years ago, and then the Dark Ages, which was a cold period. Then came the medieval mm. warm period when the Vikings or the Norse, what do you officially call the people from Scandinavia ethnically? You call them Norse or Vikings? Uh. Yeah, Nordic. the Scandinavian. Is Scandinavian. There. Yes, well, yeah. that's more, more like the nationality. Yeah. But those people colonized mm. Greenland, and there were over 4,000 people living there farming in the medieval warm period. Some people think it was even warmer than it is today at that time. Mm. Then came the Little Ice Age. And if you look at the record of glacial advances during the Holocene period, this was the greatest advance of glaciers only 300 years ago. It, I was in Switzerland in a high valley where there is a monastery that was established over 1,000 years ago. That was in the middle of the medieval warm period. At that time, they were growing all their food at the same elevation. I forget if it's 2,000 or 2,500 meters, it's quite elevated area, but a, high, but a high valley, so there was agricultural land there. Today, it's all ski hills in there. But 
they were growing their food at the same elevation they were living. As the Little Ice Age came on, they retained their home at that altitude, but they had to go down two, three, four, five hundred meters lower in altitude to grow their food because it became colder and the glaciers advanced during this period. There's a very good graph in my book that I've taken from a Spanish scientist who has discovered a great deal about this period of the Holocene interglacial. And it shows very clearly the advance of glaciers which occurred worldwide, not only in the Northern Hemisphere, but also in the Southern Hemisphere. This was a global event, the Little Ice Age. Crops failed and there were famines. One interesting fact is the River Thames in London, as you, you know, is a very large river. The last time the River Thames froze was 1814. The last time it froze so you could walk out on it from London. Before that, during the Little Ice Age, for 300 years, it had been freezing over at least twice each decade. And there were these huge winter carnivals. There's many, many paintings of them, of the people from London going out onto the ice with sleighs and horses and banners and barbecues and having huge picnics and festivals out on the ice. In 1814, it has never happened since. That's because the modern warm period coming out of the Little Ice Age occurred. And we are in the modern warm period now, which is why it is warming slightly, which is why the glaciers are retreating. And we can expect this warm period to continue for another 200 years because it goes 500 years of cooling, 500 years of warming, 500 years of cooling, 500 years of warming. So there are 1000 year peaks of warming and 1000 year bottoms of cooling. And that has been true for the last at least 3000 years. That pattern has occurred and you know what? We don't have a clue what is causing that 1000 year cycle. Nothing, we empty, but who cares? We know it exists and it would be nice if someone figured it out, but isn't it amazing that we haven't because we, we don't know of any correlation with any heavenly bodies like Jupiter or the moon or the sun. We don't know of any cycle that is this fitting in this 1000 year cycle. We do know that the Maunder minimum of solar minimum coincided with the peak of the little ice age in 1700. We do know that. And, but we don't know if that was just a one-off thing because that was the coldest it's ever been since the beginning of this 10,000 year Holocene period. It's, it, and it's so recent, it was only 300 years ago. Oh no, but the climate emergency crowd doesn't want you to know about things that happened 300 years ago. That's too far back. Really 1850 is when the world began. And that's how they act. They talk about anything before 1850, they, ah, oh, who cares about that? All I care about is we start putting CO2 in the atmosphere in 1850 and we're killing the planet. You know, it's so simplistic, so simplistic, so infantile, as in childish. It is so stupid. And yet whole world governments all around the planet have adopted this position like a new religion. Mm. And that's exactly what it is, a new religion but it's also a false God. I declare mm. it is a false God, Ricky. <laughs> it is not a real God. It, okay. Except for the Asian countries, they seem like to be likely and not that uh, interested in CO2. Uh, most, it mostly seems to be a Western dogma at CO2, uh, global warming catastrophe uh, policy. Well, Yes, um, you're, you're, you're correct, except the Asian companies play along and pay lip service 
to uh, yeah. encourage us to do what they are not it going is, to do is basically what they're yeah, doing. This, because when the United Nations uh, pre put pressure on China, they just say, yeah, yeah, we will do it uh, like in 100 years or something. Then they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't care. Yeah, exactly. And then they, they will keep quiet for a while. Uh, so, well, you know, uh, China once once was, uh, you know, they invented many things a thousand years before the Europeans did. Gunpowder, for example, except they never thought to use it to kill people. They just made fireworks with it. And uh, I, I have a, a great deal of respect for the Chinese and especially all the Asian people. They're, they are evolved very highly, uh, but the communism, no, I'm not so big on that. Uh, but they, they do have, they, they are abusing human rights and, and, and harvesting organs and all these things, which are, uh, I, I would say that's part of the evil in the world. But uh, the truth is you're, you're right. It really is only the Western nations that have adopted this new religion uh, as a religion. The, the Asians are using it politically and smartly against us, but we are uh, almost as if, almost as if we have a death wish. And in the United States today, of course, the top people in Biden's cabinet make no bones about the fact that they hate their own country. Right? They don't like themselves. And this kind of self-loathing is a disease of the mind. And all it leads to is bad things. It can't lead to good things. So uh, I, I, I fear for uh, the leadership of what w was at least the beacon of freedom in the world, the United States of America. Uh, Europe has dropped the ball long ago. They won't even accept biotechnology and plant breeding yet in Europe. No. I mean, it, it's insane. It, the, the European government is not really uh, elected. They're just politis, politicians who stay there forever. We cannot, we cannot really remove them, even if we want to. So uh, what, what started as a, a trading organization is now like a federal state kind of kind of government um, and, yes. and it, it's this this year I have a lot of resistance from many 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 countries in uh, in Europe uh, starting with the UK who, who left uh, but many Poland. many many yeah many want to like I mean, uh, so to speak maybe negotiate uh, the the terms for for like the deals now, uh, but it's a it's a tricky uh, tricky process. Um, so, well, let's you know, move on to the one, next one question. Thing, one, mm. one thing uh, the European experience teaches us mm. is that we probably don't want the kind of globalism on a a, a world basis which Europe has adopted on a mm. continental basis, because I'm afraid the mm. result would be rule by bureaucrats in Beijing. That That's mm. what we would end up with. Indeed. And is that what I, mm. I mean? I'm, I, I'm glad I'm 73 going on 74 years old. So maybe that won't happen in my lifetime, <laughs> you know, because it's not, <laughs> not looking all that great on that. Front. Yeah. No, but also sometimes when this happens, the pendulum tends to swing in one side, and then it it tends to come back when people start to realize what's going on, and they they might uh, protest. Uh, but maybe it's too late. I don't know. I'm waiting. I think someone's holding the pendulum on the other side, not letting it go. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's that's the policy that uh, keep people unaware of what really going on uh, yes you can see that with climate policy just tell the 
low resolution uh, explanation and people will buy it they're not really thinking um, yes there's the a third a question large, is uh, there's there's a large uh, movement of not really thinking going on in the world today indeed the next question is uh, kind of two pair are you a per uh, viewer on a scientific population do, do you read the uh, per view scientific populations <laughs> yes, I, I, peer review has lost a lot of its credibility. They, some people call it pal review now, because only your friends are, are peer reviewing your work. And, and indeed, most of the scientific uh, journals have been taken over by journalists, not scientists. And so we have creeping into the science journals, the same kind of censorship as we have in the popular press where they only accept certain points of view for publication and so i have two double blind peer review double blind peer review means that you don't know who is reviewing your paper and they don't know who you are who wrote the paper that's called double blind peer review and both of my contributions to the peer reviewed literature one is titled the positive impact of human CO2 emissions on the survival of life on Earth, which is about how by putting CO2 back into the atmosphere, we are correcting the imbalance that has occurred over the many, many millions of years as CO2 has gone down, 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 down. We have reversed that and are restoring a balance to the global carbon cycle and thereby actually guaranteeing the continuance of life for much longer than if we hadn't come and done that. My second paper is titled Ocean Acidification in Quotes Revisited. And this paper, you know, global warming is real, uh, global cooling is real, greenhouse gas is real. So all of the many of the aspects around the climate change scare story are real. But when it comes to ocean acidification, this was made up out of thin air when there was the 20 year hiatus or pause in temperature rising. It's in my book, the graph. I can't remember if it's between, uh, I forget which years it's between, but it's quite recent. And there was this pause in temperature going up and everybody goes, what's happening? It's supposed to get warmer. CO2 is going up and temperature isn't going up. So we have to invent something. And they called it global warming's evil twin, ocean acidification. And my paper proves that this is not only a complete fabrication and a lie, but that more CO2 in the ocean actually will increase the productivity of the oceans in the same way that more CO2 in the atmosphere increases the productivity of terrestrial plants, of land-based plants, the more CO2 in the oceans will increase the photosynthesis of plankton. And you know how it's proven? The Humboldt Current, which is off Peru on the equator, has the highest CO2 and the lowest pH, not acidic, it's just not as alkaline as the rest of the oceans the lowest pH of any body of large ocean water in the world, the highest CO2 content, and that's why it has a low pH, because it has a higher CO2 content. It's upwelling from deep ocean water, has the highest fish catch in the world. In other words, the highest biological productivity in the world. It just takes that one fact to debunk the whole ocean acidification lie. And so those two papers are available from me. Um, anybody who's watching you can email me. I'm a very open person. I don't like to get on the telephone with too many people, but when it comes to electronic communication, my email is p-m-o-o-r-e at ecosense.me E-C-O-S-E-N-S-E -E dot me. 
And if you can't remember that or you forget to write it down, you can always go to my website, ecosense.me. And on that website is a place to send me a message. And I always answer my messages. I found out just recently that they'd all been going to junk. Uh, my computer decided that the messages from my website were junk. And I'm still catching up with about 100 emails. But, but I'm, I will catch up. But all those out there who maybe have emailed me through my website, I, I apologize. But I'm going to... I'm going to answer you eventually. I will put a, uh, put a link in the description below for people to get in touch with you if they want. Thank you. Uh, do you know any scientists who get reje get their paper rejected because they are, their result wasn't fitting the the, the state of the art knowledge, uh, so so to speak? Uh, like, do you know any scientists who? try to publish something that go against the so-called consensus about CO2 or the climate policy? Oh, Ricky, it's so common. Uh, the, oh. the truth is, oh. I am not, as my main uh, job in life, a publisher of science papers. I published these two papers because I thought they were important. So I put my effort towards it. Hmm. That it I am I'm much more what you might call a popularizer of science. I speak to the general public mm. and the media and try to interpret mm. these things. I do have I would I, I would say myself a deep knowledge of a vast area of science. I've I've studied deeply mm. into these things. And when I don't know something I go and find out what the answer is. I don't just make it up in my mind. So when when I speak about something and say it's a fact, that is the best of my knowledge. Now, nobody's perfect. And, you know, there's a, a no. little joke, one person talking to another. Hey, Joe, when I learn some new information, I change my mind. What do you do? Right? And and this this speaks to the very important factor to be open, always open. That mm. is why skepticism mm -hmm. is one of the key factors in scientific discovery. Because if you close your mind, mm. you say, I know everything now. My mom, my mom taught me this too. Just because you turn 21 doesn't mean you should stop learning just because you're an adult now. <laughs> no. Now you know everything. Mm. No, you don't. You learn for life, lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. It should be everybody's ambition. Don't close your mind off to new information. Because if you get new information that contradicts what you think you know already, the most important thing is to be able to change your mind. Mark Twain said it this way. It's not what you know that will hurt you. It's what you think you know that just isn't so. Mm. It's what you think you know mm. that just isn't so. In other words, it's what you think you know that is wrong. And it's very difficult mm. to get many people to change their mind when they have it made up already. No, I'm right about that and I'm not changing my mind mm -hmm. for anything. That is the mm. wrong attitude for scientists. Scientists mm -hmm. must constantly have their mind open to new information, new interpretation, and be able to change their mind and admit that they didn't have it exactly right in the first place. It's not like a crime against mm. humanity to be wrong about things, as long as you're willing to correct yourself <laughs> when you find out. <laughs> that is a crime <laughs> against humanity, if you don't change your mm -hmm. mind when you're given it very clearly that you should. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that everybody should think in this, in this way, if you want to have an objective mm. appraisal of this world and this universe, mm. you need to be willing to change your mind in the face of new information. What would be the three most important research questions to be solved in the next, next five to 10 years, in your opinion? Beauty. Um, wow, that's very good. You know, we, we do know for sure that the 
greening of the earth is being caused by our CO2 emissions. So I don't think we need to learn that one. Um, I, I'd come back to the solar cycles. Um, I think if we were able to actually see a very clear uh, correlation and, 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 and look at cause effect uh, as being highly probable uh, with regard to solar cycles, that would be a very important step forward. Uh, now, the, the, of course, there. one thing I always like to emphasize is there are cycles upon cycles upon cycles upon cycles, and they aren't all in synchronization with each other. So you'll have a cycle that's 20 years, you'll have another cycle that's 50 years, you'll have another cycle that's 180 years. And so when you have cycles on cycles on cycles like that, that is what the IPCC means when they say that the climate is chaotic. The nature of climate is chaotic because it is multivariant to begin with. There are many variables, different, different variables all together that are hard to figure out how they're related to each other even. So you have all these variables. Then you have the fact that the variability is non-linear. It's not as if everything's going in a straight line. Some things are exponential. Other things seem just completely chaotic, like as if there is no pattern. And so when you have multivariant, non-linear, and chaotic, all in the same system, it is virtually impossible I don't know what this is. Virtually impossible to predict anything because prediction requires almost like as if you're able to put all the information into a machine, a computer, but a computer can't handle chaos. It's simply not possible. Even our minds are not able to really handle chaos. Chaos is unpredictability by nature right? Like, here's a really interesting example of chaos versus linear. The whales, have you ever been on a boat and seen how fast a porpoise can run on the bow of a boat? Mm, no. You haven't? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I have a uh, long time ago. <laughs> seen the, the dolphins. So you're in a boat and it's yeah. going maybe 15 mm. knots. And the dolphins mm. can just run ahead of you. Like they're faster yeah. than you are. And they haven't got an engine. Mm -hmm. They've just got a tail with a muscle on it. Mm. And they can go so and fast. And they're just playing. Yes. The reason they can go so fast, and the military has been studying this for years with regard to submarines. The reason they can go so fast is their skin has nerves coming to the surface everywhere very, very fine grained nervous to the, to, the, to the skin. And they can sense when water is flowing over in what's called laminar, where there's no turbulence, just it flows laminar, you know, just like water going down a hill or down a water slide, it just slides down nice and easy. There's very little friction there when you have laminar flow. But as you speed up, turbulence sets in and suddenly there's all this, all this going like this on the surface of your skin. And that results in an exponential increase in friction, in resistance. What the whales can do is they can adjust their skin like this to prevent the laminar flow from turning turbulent. They can keep it laminar. And if you watch a dolphin, you will see clear water between the surface and their skin. You don't see it all going bubbly or roiling around because they are capable of changing in micro bits the shape of their skin surface to prevent the turbulence 
from occurring. So do you, do you understand what I mean there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is, that is an, an amazing ability of a species to mm. develop a, a mechanism like that where their skin can just be fluttering and preventing in micro bits, preventing the laminar flow from going turbulent and thus greatly reducing the amount of friction when they're at high speed. And that's why their Navy would like to figure out how to emulate that, but good luck. That, that has taken millions of years of evolution to come about. But it's another one of those, for me, almost miracles that life has been able to attain. Uh, something like that, you know. Uh, that's, that, we don't know how to do that. We can't invent a thing that does that. And, and yet uh, whales and dolphins have done that for millions of years. So if you if you put some uh, if you we hijack some uh, good scientists and lock them into a cellar, uh, what 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 would, would be a problem you you would like to be solved like uh, for, for them to research? Would there I'm be any sure specific I, topic that you? I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. There might be a nuclear <laughs> meltdown or something in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I, 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 well, I said the solar one, you, you've got me wanting to think of three different things that should be, oh yes, I, I really would, would like it if they would resolve the whole sea level rise issue. It's complicated because in some places the land is sinking and some places the other, the land is rising. So that gives you a different impression of what the sea level is. Um, and, and sea level is, is very, very complicated because of all the ocean currents and the winds, etc. But I think we should have more research into historical sea levels, uh, because they, they tell us a lot and it is one of the indicators that's fairly easy to find. For example, in England, we know that 2000 years ago, the Romans had docks. There's remains of the docks that are way up high now above the sea level. So the sea has dropped since then, obviously. Another one is there's a small village on a hilltop in France called, uh, I forget its first name, but it's Sur la Mer, which means on the sea. And in fact, it is about 20 kilometers from the sea today. It's not on the sea, but it was named on the sea because a thousand years ago or whatever, it was it was on the sea. So, uh, you know, one of the great uh, deceptions that's been used in the sea level thing is traditionally sea level has been measured by tide gauges, a stick that is put in a place so that every day it can be read, and they're automated now, of course, with computers and everything, but every day it can be read exactly what the level of the sea is at that place. But the thing about sea level in, in tides, tides go up and down. So the sea level isn't a, a single number anywhere in the world. It goes up and down. In, in some places it goes up and down 10 meters. In other places, it only goes up and down half a meter. But then there are storms and the storms change how high the tide will be. So if you have, a, and, and the storms are not predicted in astronomical calculations, they are earthly things. So if you have a place where there's a tide gauge and on that day, there happens to be a strong storm that pushes the water up, is that an accurate reading? You know, no, no, it isn't in a way because it should only be when everything is still. But even the currents that are created just by the tides themselves, not the winds, but the tides, the currents result in different measurements. So I think that there should be a huge international effort 
into understanding exactly what's going on with sea level to get away from this idea that Miami is going to be drowned in five years and all this propaganda around sea level because the sea's gone up and down. And uh, in fact, it is 400 feet or 120 meters higher today than it was during the most recent glaciation only 20,000 years ago. So the sea has been going up and down and up and down all through history, depending on how much ice there is on the land is a big part of it. But also the, the way the continents are moving, you know, all over the planet, the, Philadelphia in the United States was on the equator 300 million years ago. And uh, so all the, all the continents have moved all over the place over this time. Sea level, that's what I would, because that's a really strong empirical thing that we could understand. The other thing, even though we know that CO2 is fertilizing the forests and the seas, I believe we should have a much stronger network to understand which ecosystems are responding most we know the drier ones are responding most as a general rule. And that is because increased carbon dioxide not only fertilizes the plants as in giving them nutrition, it also makes them more efficient with water. And that is a, a totally separate thing. Why does CO2 make plants more efficient with water? Because at low levels, the plant has to open all of its pores called stomata under its leaves to get enough CO2 to survive. By opening all those pores, it lets water out called transpiration. The plant doesn't need to lose as much water as it, as it is losing under low CO2 conditions, but it loses it. Therefore, the plant cannot grow in as dry a place as if it didn't lose that much water. When you put CO2 up, the plants don't have to open the pores to absorb the CO2 as much. They can even grow fewer pores to let the CO2 in. This means they don't lose as much water and therefore, if you look at the map, especially the one from the CSIRO, the Commonwealth Science and Industry Research Organization in Australia, which is their peak science body uh, funded by government and industry, you will see that the driest areas in the world, Western Australia, Western India, the Sub-Saharan Sahel, are the ones that are increasing the most in greening because it's not only because of more CO2, it's because they are able to survive now with less water. And so in Western North America, for example, in Nevada and Arizona, which are very dry, where there were only grasslands before, trees are marching out from the higher, cooler elevations, marching out into these grasslands today. This is documented with aerial photography, Craig Idso, who is the uh, founder of CO2science.org. Everyone should go to this website, CO2science.org. It is the largest compendium of peer reviewed literature on carbon dioxide that there is in the world. And it's very well organized and you can study a lot of things there. But uh, the, the, I would say that a much tighter regime of monitoring the impact of increased CO2 on uh, wild plants and farm plants around the world would be uh, adding greatly to our knowledge. That's three things. I got Excellent. it. Mm -hmm. Next question. Excellent. Um, for for looking into the past, we need to use uh, proxy data 
because we don't have any direct measurements. Which of the proxy type do you uh, have most confident in? Uh, which one do you trust most of this proxy data? Well, oxygen 18 is a very important one for marine sediments. Um, I believe it's also used with regard to temperature in ice cores. So that's a very important isotope uh, in, in understanding uh, the, the, the changes in, in historical patterns. Um, carbon uh, dating is another one, but it only goes back, I forget how many thousand years, but it's not like millions of years. It, whereas oxygen 18 can go back 100 million years or more. Uh, another really interesting proxy is the foraminifera. They are zooplankton, which have calcareous shells. And their evolution is well known with regard to the timing of how many millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. They've been around for half a billion years. And so in marine sediments, you can use the forams as they're uh, colloquially called, foraminifera is their, is their uh, Latin. And uh, they can be used to date sediments. Those are some of the most important ones. Um, How about tree rings? Pardon me? How about tree rings? Are they useful? I don't find the biological indicators that useful. You know why? Because they depend mm. so much on weather. And mm. I, I think the purely physical ones are much more important. They can't change by how much mm. rainfall there is or whether there's a landslide mm. or some other factor going on. So, for example, the work that... Uh, Michael Fake Man uh, did on the hockey stick, where he was using tree <laughs> rings. Uh, mm. well, he just plain lied, of course. But uh, mm. I, I don't agree with that with that t type of proxy very much. Uh, I, I would not use many many of the biological indicators. I would stick to physical and chemical. You know. Mm. Atomic. I guess it's, it depends what you're looking for. Uh, no. Uh, if, you, if you take tree rings, how do you know that the reason it grew faster in one year wasn't because of rainfall or because more sunshine? Mm. And, yeah. You know, you cannot mm. possibly extrapolate that. It, can't, it simply can't be done. But with oxygen-18 and foraminifera and carbon dating, you can be virtually certain that you're getting it right. Mm. Atmospheric uh, CO2 has risen for about about 100 parts per million over the last 150 years. Does it all come from humans, in your opinion, or is it also natural, also from na nature? Well, I think by process of elimination, for example, the United States Geological Service, which is a highly technical group of people, geologists, who study the Earth's crust and the whole Earth all the time. They say that volcanoes, volcanoes are responsible for less than 1% of the amount of emissions that humans emit each year now with our large consumption of fossil fuels. So they aren't really a factor any longer. Volcanoes were the reason CO2 is in the atmosphere in the first place. But that was in the early years of the Earth when it was much warmer inside. Not many people realize that the reason the Earth is so hot in its core, not just 60 miles down, the crust ends and it becomes like more liquid. Not, it's not like water, but it flows, it can flow, like lava flows when it comes out of a volcano, that, that red stuff. And so the reason the Earth is hot in the middle is not because of 
heat left over from when the earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago. That would have been long gone by now if that's the only thing it was. The heat in the earth is caused by radioactive decay of radioactive elements such as uranium, radium, and thorium, and potassium, potassium 40, which is in every banana you eat. That is what keeps the Earth's core hot. But much of that radiation has long ago decayed. There's only a percentage of it left because there's this thing called a half-life. For example, uranium-235, which is the element we use for nuclear energy, has a half-life of only 800 million years. I say only because in the 4.6 billion year life of the earth, there's been quite a few 800 million year periods. I think it's six or seven. So the amount of uranium-235 has been halved seven times, which means there's only a very small amount of it left compared to what there was when the earth was born, and therefore much less heat coming from uranium-235 in the earth's core. Now, what that heat did in the early years was it caused the carbon in the Earth's interior to come out as carbon dioxide, oxidized. And that's where the CO2 in the atmosphere came from in the first place. So did the water. All the H2O came out from the interior and formed the oceans. But the difference is, the big difference between water and carbon dioxide, which if you remember are the two things that are combined in photosynthesis to make sugars in plants, which is the basis for all energy of all life. Just water and carbon dioxide, CO2 plus H2O equals sugar with a little sunlight to make it happen. Water has not disappeared. Waters, there's probably just as much water now on the earth as there was in the beginning when it came out from the heating of the interior. But carbon dioxide has constantly declined because whereas water does not end up in sediments, water does not get turned into rocks, water does not get turned into fossil fuels. Whereas carbon dioxide, the carbon in carbon dioxide ends up in fossil fuels, the hydrocarbons, right? And ends up in carbonaceous rocks, calcium carbonate being the main one, which we call limestone, chalk, and marble. All of the marble in all the beautiful cathedrals of Europe is carbon dioxide that was turned into rocks by living creatures by shelled creatures, the coral reefs, the clams, the oysters, the mussels, the plankton, the foraminifera I mentioned before are calcium shelled zooplankton. They're just big enough to see like a tiny grain of sand. Whereas even smaller than that are the coccolithophores, which are the phytoplankton, the plants of the basis of the food chain in the sea they are actually microscopic. You can't see them with the naked eye. And they're a beautiful thing if you look them up, coccolithophores. So the CO2 has been sucked out of the atmosphere over time, whereas the water has not. And so that is why it's so important that we are putting CO2 back into the atmosphere today to restore a balance to the global carbon cycle. Where were we? You said mm. that was a short answer, um, but I'm just trying to remember where it started. <laughs> where did it start, Ricky? What was the main question there? Of of the rise in CO2 of, over the last 150 years, it doesn't oh, yes. all come from humans. I should get to that. Well, of course, I've ruled out volcanoes now in the modern era as a major source of CO2. It, it's simply not. And by process of elimination, there is no other new source. The only other new source is our taking hydrocarbons 
that have been buried for millions of years and putting the carbon back into the atmosphere by burning them. And basically what we're doing when we're burning them is we are releasing the energy of the sun that created those hydrocarbons in the first place. On the land, let's take coal, for example, which is on the land, was created on land. Forests were created by, by sunlight. Wood was created. Wood is 50% carbon from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's how wood is made. And coal is basically made from wood. But the wood transformed from wood, which is a carbohydrate, the oxygen was, was driven off by heat deep in the ground, and you end up with a hydrocarbon. But it still has basically all the energy that the sun made it with. So the reason we burn fossil fuels is to get the energy, not to get the CO2. It's only inadvertently, by chance, that we have restored a balance to the carbon cycle. In the same way that the marine organisms that created all the calcium carbonate limestone deposits and took the carbon out of the sea and put it on the bottom of the ocean, they didn't do that on purpose. They didn't mean to take the carbon out of the, of the living in ecosystem. What they meant to do was to build armor plating for themselves, a completely different reason. And the same with us, we didn't mean to burn fossil fuels in order to put CO2 in the atmosphere. That wasn't our purpose. Our purpose was to get energy. So it's funny that the, the marine calcifying organisms, which are responsible for taking more than 90% of all the carbon out of the atmosphere over the millions of years. They didn't mean to do that. It was completely serendipitous that that, that is what they did. What they meant to do was make armor plating for themselves, which was a brilliant evolutionary strategy. Like you take a clam without a shell. What's it protected from? Nothing, right? It's just a nice blob of food, right? But when you put a thick shell around a clam, a seagull has to take it up 50 meters in the air and drop it on a rock and break it to get the food in it. So they have to work a little harder. And that was a very brilliant strategy on the part of many different taxa of marine species learned to make these shells for themselves, corals being one of the main ones. Whereas then we come along and we discover these fossil fuels that have been laying in the ground for 100 million years and say, hey, this is better than wood. And there's lots of it. So let's use it. And we did. And we put more CO2 in the atmosphere because it was all made of carbon. And the, the thing to remember, though, <clears throat> yes, we are by far the major reason why and there's no real other known reason why that CO2 has risen. It, it, we didn't do it on purpose. We did it because we wanted to burn the fossil fuels for energy. So we can't sort of say we are so smart that we saved life from an ever declining CO2 concentration. All we can say is we're so smart that we figured out that's what we did by mistake almost. And, 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 and thankfully, it was a really, really important good mistake that we made by putting the CO2 back in the atmosphere. And going forward, if you look at the greenhouse growers in the world, the commercial greenhouse growers, one of the main reasons that people are spending so much money building greenhouses is not only to be able to keep it warmer inside, but to be able to increase the CO2 level inside the greenhouse. That is one of the primary things they do. They actually buy carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide generating machines, which can use natural gas to create an exhaust of CO2. They buy that. It's worth them paying money for the CO2 
to get up to 60% increase in yield due to the CO2 fertilization effect, and they will double. Right now, CO2 is just over 400 parts per million. They like 800. They like 1,200. And that is a much more natural level of CO2 for plants historically in evolution, going, you know, the, over the hundreds of millions of years that plants have evolved on the earth. They were growing in those kinds of levels of CO2 most of the time. Even up to 2,000 and 3,000, the plants continue to grow faster. But because there's a diminishing return on the amount of growth you get, after a certain time, the economics cuts in and it's not worth paying for more CO2 at a certain point because the amount of increased growth you get isn't enough. It's the increased growth slows down as CO2 goes up into the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 level. But at about 1,200 parts per million, you have kind of optimum conditions. In other words, three times the level it is in the global atmosphere today is what commercial greenhouse growers choose as their level of CO2 for maximum growth of plants. And when you think about it, Ricky, we are not plants, but if there weren't any plants, there wouldn't be any us. We would not exist. Animals only exist because of plants. And therefore we should think like a plant because they are the basis of our existence. It's not animals that are the basis of our existence because the animals we eat are only there because they ate plants. It all goes back to plants. It all goes back to photosynthesis. It all goes back to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the oceans, supporting the existence of life on this most beautiful earth that we are so blessed to inhabit. What to say to young people, to children who are scared hearing that CO2 is poison or pollution? Do we have an angle to open their mind in order to help them deal with their uh, anxiousness about what they hear through the education system and, uh, and media? Well, if there is a great evil, it is the preying upon young minds who do not mm. have the intellect yet or the knowledge yet to, to figure it out for themselves. And therefore, I would say this is child abuse. I would say this is mental abuse of children and that people who are doing it should probably be in jail. And there's so many people who are doing it from Greta to Al Gore and all the rest. They are, what they are doing is evil. Of course it is because they are lying they are lying to the children that the children are in danger as a result of the CO2. So I would say the only solution is for parents to read my book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, and then to talk to their children because the children can't read my book. You need to be at least high school, uh, maybe, you know, 16 years old to read my book. And, and, and it, it, is writ it is written clearly enough and in plain English enough that 16 year old educated young people can understand it. But four year olds can understand it and eight year olds can understand it and neither can 12 year olds. So that's why I say it's a, a crime against humanity and a crime against children to, to be brainwashing them with this stuff. But uh, parents, if you read my book, which people believe is the best book to understand this, it's got over 500 five-star reviews on Amazon. It's only been out a few months and it's been highly received, very well received. And I'm about to do some podcasts and some interviews coming up that will give it even more high profile. Read the book. Read the book and talk to your children because you'll be able to interpret what I've written in a way that you can speak to your kids in a way that they can understand. But there, there is no other way. I mean, you know, 
it is just so tragic that people would prey on children like this. And, and uh, as I say, it, it's a crime against humanity, it's a crime against children, and it is an evil thing for people to be doing, and they should be ashamed of themselves, and they should lock themselves in a closet and turn the light off and never come out. <laughs> How how about a kids kids version of your book? Maybe a new no, project. No, it's not me. That, that is not my <laughs> project. Uh, I, mm. I I I can't. I, you, no. you know, being a child, uh, being being an author for children is a very specialty, and mm -hmm. uh, I would hope that somebody might do that someday. They'd probably get mm. cancelled immediately. But <laughs> you know, it, yeah, you might be right. Um, the the last one is more like a comment. I, I get a few of these comments, uh, but I, I choose to take only one. Uh, my deepest respect for your speaking out openly, and it seems to me with an honest heart. Thank you. Um, any comments about that? Well, I'm I'm flattered and I'm grateful that people can see my honesty. I. I know in my own heart, I'm about as honest a person as you'll ever find. Uh, mm. I, I've been taught this all my life. Mm. I know it's the right path. I know that lying is evil, and I know that that brainwashing children is evil. Mm. And I would, would of course, never do such a thing in a million years. But mm. I thank you for trusting what I'm saying. I expect you to question what I'm saying, and and. If you have any questions, you're, you've been given the opportunity to come back to me, and mm. I'll be I'll I'll answer anything I can honestly. If you find mm. some point I've made that you think there's a a different alternative, uh, mm -hmm. I'm open to it. Mm -hmm. Open mind, mm. open heart, and uh, appreciation for again what a beautiful world we live on. Instead mm. of thinking we're all going to hell in a handbasket and that the end is coming soon. I mean, mm. what's the matter with these people? <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. And thank yeah. you very much, Ricky, for uh, such thorough uh, opportunity to speak. Um, mm. I'm hoping my dialogue with you uh, will spread because it's been given such an open opportunity to elaborate on mm. all these things in a careful way. Uh, and uh, I congratulate you on the work you're doing. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much. It was my pleasure to talk to you, and uh, t thank you for taking your time to, to talk with us. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Ricky. I know I'll see you again. You have a nice day, too. Bye-bye.